Hi, and welcome to the slideshow for Module 6, where we'll be talking about the early medieval, the Carolingian, and the Romanesque periods. This is quite a span of time. We're actually covering about 600 years today, and we're covering a number of different geographical areas. Some of the major themes we'll be talking about today, with the early medieval period, we, there's a focus on portable art objects as symbols of wealth. There's a lot of nomadic tribes in this period, and so many of the artistic objects that survived were things that were easy to carry around with them. Again, we have an emphasis on Christianity. This is going to be a theme for the next several modules. It's the dominant religion of the Western world at this point in time, and so that is why there are so many monuments associated with Christianity. Also, we'll talk about book production in monastic context. This is a Roman type of object that moves into Northern Europe, and there's lots of fabulous images that these books contain. Once we move to the Romanesque section, we'll be talking about such things as pilgrimage and also the cult of relics, which was this phenomenon that inspired lots of pilgrimage. So we have a lot to get through today. We better get to it. As always, we start with the map. I'm showing you this one. It doesn't have a lot of the cities indicated on it that we'll be talking about today, but I wanted to give you a sense of what we've been looking at. We've been very focused the first several modules of our course with civilizations directly on the Mediterranean Sea. But as the Roman Empire falls, those capitals that are on the Mediterranean start to lose some of their power. So we're going to be looking at objects that come from the northern part of Europe, what we see here indicated as the Kingdom of the Franks. The earliest object we're going to look at today actually comes from Suffolk, England. So that's right up here in this little spur off of England. We'll also be looking at a monument that's found in present-day Germany, which was the capital of the Kingdom of Charlemagne, which is this Kingdom of the Franks. We'll also be, at the end of the lecture, be looking at an object that comes from northern France or southern England, almost certainly France though. And then we'll also be talking about some monuments in southern France as part of the Romanesque section. So here's some nice images to look at while I'm talking about some background on early medieval art. So the first section we're talking about is early medieval art. The Roman army withdrew from Britain in 406 in order to defend Gaul against Germanic peoples crossing into the empire. When Constantine moves the capital, things fall apart in the west. They are not really Romans anymore. Because Constantine moved the empire, this allows the Germanic Angles and Saxons and the Norse Utes to migrate into the British Isles because the army has left Britain. Roman, Germanic, Celtic, and Norse influences create a new synthesis of art forms that are found in the British Isles. As I mentioned before, these are largely nomadic peoples, so we see examples of people wearing their status. So these fabulous objects are often part of clothing or other. These peoples, these tribes, lived near the Roman Empire and were interested in it, but every, and every once in a while a great ruler would claim the status of a Roman Empire, but they were descended from Germanic nomadic tribes. This word medieval is a word that's applied to the period later, which basically just means this middle period. Initially, it has negative connotations as something between the classical and the Renaissance. And you'll often hear people call it the Dark Ages. We will not be calling it that because that has its own set of connotations. So we're going to be focusing in the early medieval period on these nomadic warrior cultures and monasteries, two very different cultural groups, but the two major groups that are producing art at this time. So there's a fusion of Celtic cultures, which had already existed in the British Isles, and then what we call Anglo-Saxon, and that comes from these Germanic tribe names, the Angles and the Saxons. So they begin to express power and authority through special objects that are portable. Eventually, these people settle down and are converted to Christianity, which leads to monastic life. So what I'm showing you here is an image of a helmet or a mask, and then the excavation of the site where it came from. What This is the excavation of a site called Sutton Hoo in southern England. The couple of objects I'm going to show you here were found in a burial of what must have been a wealthy and powerful figure. He was buried with weapons and armor and luxury items. This was found in 1938, and this burial happened inside a ship. So this wealthy person was buried inside the ship, and then they put earth over it to create a burial mound, sort of like what we talked about with the early Egyptians, even before Mastabas. Many of these mounds had been raided over the centuries, but this one remained largely intact, even though it had been plowed over. You can see in this image the ghost of the boat. The wood deteriorated, but the nails constructing it survived, and the imprint it left in the ground survived, because wood is an organic material that disintegrates. 
Here's the primary image that I want you to be familiar with from the Sutton Hoo burial. This is a purse cover and it dates to about 630 CE and it's done in a technique called cloisonne, which is a, a glass technique and it also has some semi-precious stones here. As I said, this is a purse cover and it belonged to a bag that was filled with gold coins. So the cover, because it's metal and glass and stone, it survived and the coins survived, but the bag was almost certainly leather and that, like the wood of the ship, also deteriorated. This is characteristic of what's called the animal style, which is characterized by symmetry, stylized human and animal forms, and complex, complex abstract patterning. So you see all these various animals in the middle. You can just make out that they're animals. They start to feel almost like patterns instead. Uh, they're very abstracted. The white background that you're seeing here would have originally been bone or ivory, and that also deteriorated. The whole purse cover is situated around what we call heraldic designs, where we have these symmetrical figures facing each other. So it's very similar on both sides of this vertical axis. It's essentially identical. Even the smaller elements within are rather symmetrical themselves. So there's a system of geometric patterning going on here. In the lower half, we see four groups of animals with interlocking jaws and legs. In the center, you see these two large Swedish hawks and they are attacking what looks like ducks. And flanking those, we see men who are either being attacked or are controlling a pair of rampant beasts. And rampant means they're rearing up on their back legs. It's not really clear what's going on with any of the animals here, but the patterning is based on all of these animal forms. It comes from a couple of different types of inspiration. So as I mentioned, the hawks are Swedish. The interlacing animals, how connected they are, and especially if you look up here at this, I don't even know what to call this, a weird serpent-like figure, see how it's all interlocked? That's a very Germanic thing. And the polychroming of the gem style, the multicolored gems, is Eastern continental. So it comes from the Eastern part of the European continent. So I mentioned this word cloisonne, and it's a type of enamel where these small cells surrounded by metallic embrasures that we see all around here, all of this gold. These are containing these small cells that are filled with a powdered glass. And then once those are heated, it makes these enamels. It's sort of like making a glazed brick or something. These zoomorphic types, these animal types, become so integrated into the patterning that they're almost lost, especially, I think, up here. It's hard to identify at first that these are even supposed to be animals. So this is just one example of these interlacing patterns that we'll see today that's very characteristic of the early medieval period. Remember that's because it's combining these Celtic influences with those of the Anglo-Saxons. This was a very rich object, so it would have conveyed a certain status upon whoever was carrying this purse. Of course, the money in the purse is also conveying status, but the fact that this is made of gold, semi-precious stones, and this cloisonne glass means that it was a very precious object. As I mentioned before, people began to settle a bit over time. They became much less nomadic, and they started to settle in northern England and in France. Eventually, Christian missionaries come along and convert them. Many of these cultures become very good at the ascetic extremes of monastic life. Monastic life is organized around schedules of prayer. They become involved in the word of God, especially because their pagan religions did not have texts of instruction, so the, the Bible and the texts of Christianity became very interesting to them. And they expressed this through the setting up of what's called a scriptorium. So every monastery would have a scriptorium, or the plural is scriptoria. Monks often lived in very uncomfortable places. So for example, in Ireland, they would live on these remote islands, and they would make little stone huts, and they made these very incredibly beautiful books there. For example, here I'm showing you a page that comes from one of these monasteries in Ireland. This is called the Book of Duro, and I'm showing you the page of St. John, and it dates to sometime after 650 CE. So I'm saying it's the page of St. John. That's one of the four gospel books. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of the four evangelists comes to be associated with a certain symbol. And today, something we might even talk about later in this course, John is associated with an eagle, but when this book was created, he was associated with a lion. So this is a new kind of Christian art. The Christian subject and the format of a book is something that's completely Mediterranean. 
So they brought their own artistic traditions with the interlacing that you can see around the edge and all the patterning on the body of the lion. They adapt that to a foreign format and subject with this Mediterranean subject and format of the book. So you have this interlacing frame with varying patterns throughout, this schematic rendering of the lion in profile. This is the earliest book from this region that survives. One of the reasons it survived so well is because it was believed to have belonged to St. Patrick. And so it was put into a casket and kept for its power. It wasn't actually used in any services or anything, and that's why it survived so well. You want to think of this as a design rather than a depiction. So this lion stands for St. John, but it's not really supposed to, the interest is not in depicting a lion as realistically as possible. Instead, it's about adapting this lion form to the way they like to make decorative patterns. So it's a design here. The book is in Latin, and the other book we'll look at today as well is also in Latin, because that is the primary language of the church. So even though they are adopting this Mediterranean religion and book format, the artistic language is still very much their own. Notice there's no, not even a ground line for, for the lion to stand on. There's no attempt to recreate space. There's not a lot of attempt to give any sort of musculature or real body mass to the lion, although you do have these nice patterned swirls that sort of indicate some of his the joints of his limbs. So let's move on to this image. What we have here is a page from a very famous manuscript called the Book of Kells. This was probably made in Iona, Scotland, which is an island off the coast of Scotland, in the late 8th or the early 9th century. And the page I'm showing you is called the Tunc Crucifixerant page, because that is the text that we see here. You can see this Tunc Crucifixerant right here. There's some more words as well. With these books, we also see something called ribbon interlacing, where these intricate patterns these little strands of what seem like ribbons. You can see it here, over here as well. They're all hooked together and interlaced, just like we saw with the purse cover and also with the patterning on the Book of Duro. Again, with the Book of Kells, you want to keep in mind that idea of continuing pagan Anglo-Saxon and Celtic traditions, but assimilating them for Christian use with a Christian subject and also in the manuscript form. At first, it only seems this swirl of patterns but if you start looking in the details, there is a lot hidden inside this. Uh, these spiraling and interlacing patterns derive from metalwork objects like what we saw with the Sutton Hoop purse cover. This page is from the Gospel of Matthew, and the text depicted here translates to then they crucified Christ and with him two thieves. So there's this imminent connection between all of the elements. So this is the letter T, but notice it's actually a lot more than that. There's this wild beast head that starts at the end here. And if you follow this around, you can see that these are actually his little feet. So he's built into this letter. And then you have this other creature over here, a lion or a dragon, who seems to be breathing fire. Maybe that's what it's supposed to be. It's not clear if it's supposed to be fire exactly or if it's just a decorative pattern. Even more with this letter T, you have all sorts of little fish and dragons inside of it, and their tails turn into ribbons, and certain fish eat the ends of the ribbons, so everything is interconnected, everything continues each other, it's this really intricate patterning. So these books were more than just texts, they were these vivid images that were also functional in this book format. On the sides, we have these ve three very small insects that have human heads, they're bust-length portraits, and we see most of the faces in profile, and notice also that the eye is in profile, a lot like what the Egyptians did. So it's a very careful attention to detail. Words are images at this point. These illuminated manuscripts were an important part of medieval missionary work. They were used to illustrate the stories of the Bible to new Christian pr practitioners, people that they converted. They were often displayed on altars and in processions during religious holidays. And this isn't the kind of object that would have been produced in that room, the one I called a scriptorium. And not only would they create these lavishly illustrated, or we call them illuminated manuscripts if they have illustrations, they would also just copy out other kinds of texts, sometimes not even with these fabulous images. But something like this is a display piece, something really meant to be seen and used to be seen from afar, but also to study close up, because if you don't look at this thing close up, you're going to miss so many details. So now I want to move forward to talk about 
the period we call Carolingian art. That word Carolingian is named for the emperor Charlemagne. His name in Latin is Carlos Magnus, so it sounds sort of like Carolingian just a little bit. And Charlemagne means Charles the Great. He wasn't a very well educated man, but he had respect for poets and philosophers and he set them up at his court. He wanted to make himself become more educated or seem more educated. He became king of the Franks in 771. He really wanted to legitimize himself and to be recognized as better than other kings. So he very consciously made himself into a Roman. Essentially, he wanted to be Constantine because he was a Christian. So here I'm showing you the extent of his kingdom. The green area is the size it was when he became king of the Franks, and you can see the yellow areas that he actually conquered, and so he expanded his empire. The center of his empire is this city called Aachen, which is in modern-day Germany. You can see that he even had a lot of incursions into Italy. So he was trying to rid it of what we now call the barbarians, the various Gothic tribes. Here I'm showing you an equestrian portrait of Charlemagne. In an equestrian portrait, remember, he's choosing to have himself depicted as a Roman emperor. He wanted to revive the Roman imperial past. The skill for creating large-scale bronze works had been lost after the fall of the Roman Empire. And Charlemagne's equestrian statue here is trying to find that again. You see him here crowned on horseback, dressed in not exactly a toga, but definitely not armor. And then he's holding that orb in his hand, which is a symbol for dominion. So I keep emphasizing that Charlemagne wanted to be a Roman emperor, so he got the Pope to crown him as the Holy Roman Emperor. And that's this is the beginning of that phrase, the Holy Roman Empire with Charlemagne. So on December 25th in the year 800, Charlemagne went to Old St. Peter's, and the Pope crowned him as the Emperor of the Romans and gave him the title Augustus. So there are these very clear connections. It's happening in Rome. He's being crowned by the person with the most power in Rome in that time. And the Pope, the leader of the Christian church, is de declaring him emperor. One of the other things he did was to call on Benedictine monks and nuns to help revive culture and learning. So he establishes this court at Aachen, and it became a leading intellectual center of Western Europe. And he looked to Rome and Ravenna for inspiration, two centers that we've also discussed. So here I just want to compare these two monuments for just a minute. These are quite different in scale. The Charlemagne sculpture is, is rather small, and the bronze of Marcus Aurelius is over life size. But you can see how similar they actually are. You have a horse who's lifting one leg. Notice also that with Charlemagne, the horse is quite a bit smaller than a horse ought to be to support the figure. But again, with like we talked about with Marcus Aurelius, that's to emphasize the figure himself. Notice how differently they're shown, though, as well. Marcus Aurelius did not have a crown. There was no need for him to have a crown. Charlemagne is trying to make a statement about who he is exactly. And he's also holding this orb of dominion, which is not something you see with Marcus Aurelius. He's also not raising his, Charlemagne's not raising his hand to address the crowd or even make any sort of connection with any viewer of the object. The monument I'd like to talk about now is the Palace Chapel of Charlemagne in Aachen, Germany, and it dates to 792 to 805 CE. What I'm showing you in the bottom left here is the entire palace complex. So remember I said it's a palace chapel, and that's because it's attached to the imperial palace at Aachen. We have seen this before. Remember Hagia Sophia is also a palace chapel on a much grander scale than Aachen, but still attached to the imperial palace, so it has certain connotations. Sometimes you'll hear chapels like this called Palatine chapels, and sometimes you'll read about this chapel in particular being called the Palatine Chapel of Charlemagne. So here we have the centrally planned church. Here you see the courtyard in front of the church. In this view, we're standing in this courtyard looking towards this large facade, so it's quite large scale, you can tell from the the people here, and it was directly connected to the various other areas of the palace. The site contained homes for himself, his family, and advisors. It also had administrative buildings, the palace school, and workshops. And this shows the first step towards dual towered facades of later cathedrals that we'll see later on. Those don't survive here, but you can see them in the plan here, these two towers. You want to keep that in mind, we'll be seeing that later today and also in the next module where we talk about the Gothic 
This structure shows this Carolingian synthesis of Roman, early Christian, and Northern styles. So he's drawing inspiration from Rome, Ravenna, but also from what is now modern day Germany and France, because that is where his kingdom was. Here's a view of the interior and the plan on the right side. Essentially, he decided to build a version of San Vitale, but he translated this into Northern materials and for Northern needs. Now, Ravenna is much closer to Aachen than Rome, and so that makes sense why he would want to draw upon that as a model. Charlemagne was very interested in the monuments in Ravenna, and remember, we call it Byzantine, we call San Vitale in Ravenna Byzantine, but he would have thought of it as Imperial Christian Roman. If I go back to this view for just a second, I want to point out this courtyard once more. Charlemagne would present himself over the main entrance here, so it's not exactly how it originally appeared, uh, but he would present himself there and speak to the people. This courtyard was so large originally that 7,000 people could fit inside. Some people call the time of Charlemagne the Carolingian Renaissance because styles change pretty considerably at this point. One of the hallmarks of this new style under Charlemagne is this clear division of the structure into parts and also the strong vertical emphasis. So we are looking in this interior view as if we're standing here looking towards the high altar. You see, get this very strong sense of verticality and you can also see just how segregated each different area of the church is. A centrally planned building, this looks rather open, but these are quite large piers. You can get a sense of their size looking at the interior view here. And you can see just how separated these gallery levels are. This has two very distinct levels, one for the citizens and then the higher one for Charlemagne and his family. That's where he would sit. He would have his own private view of the altar, basically. He had his throne placed on axis with the altar. One of the major new additions to this site, in contrast to other centrally planned churches, is the addition of what we call the West Work, which is that large facade. Here I'm showing it to you again. You can get a better sense of it right here. San Vitale didn't have anything like this. So this west-facing portion is this one of the major additions that Charlemagne, Charlemagne and his architects made. This was flanked by these two stair towers that led up to that private throne room that opened out into the rotunda on the second level. So again, the separation of the rulers from the others. The fact that he had his own space was very much like what Justinian had organized at Hagia Sophia. The upper level there was also for the emperor and his family. So if you can imagine being up in this gallery level from about this vantage point, Charlemagne would be able to look down on the altar here, but also he's not completely disrespectful. He could also look up to the images. And up here we have several different images of Christ up in the dome space. So he would look up to Christ and look down to the altar. There's a lot of interesting decoration going on here. We have these nice decorative arches with bicolored boussoirs. Those are the little stones that make up the archway. In order to construct this church, he actually had spolia brought from Rome and Ravenna. And spolia is something taken from one context and put in a new one. So from Rome and Ravenna, he brought bronze doors and columns. But then the rest of the structure was made from local materials. This period in art history is about adapting different influences to your own particular culture. And we see Charlemagne doing that as well. And now we're gonna move on to our next time period. I wanted to go straight to this image just to show you how different, how differently the builders conceived a space versus somebody like Charlemagne. We're moving on to the Romanesque period. And the style is not named for anything except someone's observation of the shape of the arch in the buildings. Remember the Romans were known for building with arches, so they called it Romanesque. This appeared in Western Europe, the style encompasses more variation, but we're going to focus on these standard aspects, especially the arched aspects. And this happens around 1000 CE, so a couple of hundred years after Charlemagne. After the Roman Empire, the buildings got smaller and smaller, except for a couple of notable exceptions that, like we talked about, like Hagia Sophia and also the Palatine Chapel at Aachen. They even stopped building vaulted structures to a certain extent. Starting around 1000, lots of churches begin being built on a larger scale and with vaulted stone roofs. And this is much better for fire safety. Fire was very common and if your structure was made of wood, it would be gone in a heartbeat. We also start seeing large scale monumental sculpture that is attached to a lot of these buildings. So there's a major phenomenon that occurs in Christianity 
over the course of time. We talked about it with old St. Peter's, but that is the cult of the saints. It had existed for centuries before the Romanesque, but it took on a very new character in this period. Romanesque Christians believed that the physical remains of holy people, called relics, were filled with a special kind of power. They believed that saints could perform miracles if they wanted to. And so this affected the construction of churches. Lots of people went to visit these saints so that they wouldn't go to hell. And so these churches are built to accommodate large groups of pilgrims. On this map that I'm showing you, we see Western Europe, we see the Holy Roman Empire, which was the remnants of Charlemagne's empire. The Kingdom of France had sprung up as well. And I want you to notice these four lines that converge into a single line here. Those ones that run through France, through northern Italy, and these are the major pilgrimage routes going to one major destination called Santiago de Compostela. It is said that the stars of the Milky Way pointed the way to Santiago de Compostela, which is the name of that means St. James of the Field of Stars. Compostela is Field of Stars, and this is where the Apostle James was buried, so it was a major pilgrimage site. So if you were a pilgrim, you might follow one of these routes, and you wouldn't just walk and walk and walk until you got to Santiago. Instead, you would stop at a number of places along the way. Often these people would stay in different sort of hospices or hospitals, or sometimes they would sleep in church spaces. It, it actually developed its own sort of economy around it. Money moved around when people went on pilgrimage. And they started having to modify the structures to accommodate all of these people. So today we will be looking at a monument in Conk, this city right here, as well as some sculpture from a city here called Otom, which it's not shown directly on one of these lines, but it's close enough to the pilgrimage routes that we know that a lot of people would have visited it. So art becomes very important to convey messages to all of these people moving through your city, because one of the primary aims of Christians is to convert others to Christianity. So here is a far off view of the major Romanesque church we're gonna be talking about. And this is in that city called Conk, and this is the church of Saint-Foy. This church was constructed between 1050 and 1120, and it's on one of these major pilgrimage roads. So these journeys could last a year or more because it's not easy to get around in those days. You had to deal with all sorts of trouble along the way, like robbers and sickness. There were even guidebooks written on how to survive. Monasteries often offered food and lodging along the way, and this is one of those examples. We have a monumental scale here. You can see it rising above the town of Kong. I wanted to remind you very quickly of the form, the basilica form, this Latin cross plan of old St. Peter's. Remember I said it shaped all later architecture, and you'll see now that that is very much true, that this longitudinal basilica plan becomes revived, becomes the most common type in the Romanesque period. Here I'm showing you the plan of saint -Foy. This is on a monumental scale. It's again a Latin cross plan we see here with the nave and the transept. Here you also have the apse like we're used to seeing, although it's not at the very back of the building anymore. One of the major characteristics of the Romanesque is modularity. That is, they conceived of elements as individual parts that could be added or removed. So for example, we have these very similar areas here. They're all very similar to one another. These are called bays and you could add more as, as you saw fit. So you have the central nave, but you also have these side aisles, so lots of people could be accommodated throughout the space, and it's designed to hold a lot of pilgrims. Remember, that is the major function here. So we're, we've seen this aisled nave before with old St. Peter's, but there's something different going on here. Pilgrimage churches also have aisles in the transept, which is not something we saw with old St. Peter's. And what that means is that it allowed the visitor to travel around the entire church, visiting every altar and chapel without disrupting any service that was going on at the high altar in the app. So what that means is you could enter from either this door, the portal is what you call the major door, or sometimes people would enter from the transept door, and you would walk around visiting different chapels in each bay. Then you would walk around the transept, then as you walked around the apse, this area is called the ambulatory. There were often several chapels. We see three here on the apse, around the apse, and you would stop and visit the relic in every single chapel. Most churches also had some kind of connection from the back to whatever relic was under the high altar. There might be a screen 
or someplace you could put your hand in or something like that. So you could continue around the space visiting every chapel and be on your merry way without ever bothering a service. So here you see the plan in contrast to this overview that they're actually flipped a little bit differently here. So here is the apps end. You see that right here. So you can see that the actual space of the primary apps where the high altar was was actually a higher vaulted space whereas the ambulatory had a lower roof unfortunately where these other chapels are being blocked here but you get a good sense of the transept you have a large lantern over the crossing that space where the nave and the transept meet is called the crossing and there are enormous piers holding that lantern up just like at Charlemagne's Palace Chapel, you have these two enormous towers, part of that West Work area. Here's a view of the apse end, just to give you a sense of what those chapels look like. These are typically referred to as radiating chapels since they come off of this space. So here's that original view of the interior that I showed you when I began talking about the Romanesque. You can get a sense in this image the, of how the spaces are connected. We're looking here through the body of the nave, through the choir, and you can see here where the lantern stands over this central space. Here's the high altar and the apse. You see how much it communicates actually with the ambulatory here because it's just a screen of columns rather than being a really separate division. A lot of light fills the space through the lantern and several windows here. As we move forward in time, you'll see that it's a priority for them to open up as many windows as possible, and there's lots of structural innovations that take place, especially in the Gothic period, which we'll do for our next module, for making the walls as thin as possible for allowing lots and lots of windows to let light in the space. Remember, they do not have electricity. So you see all the archways within. These are also considered piers around here, but you can see that columns have been attached to them, engaged columns, to articulate the space a bit, to add some kinds of decoration. It gives a sculptural element to the interior. Here's another view that gives you maybe a little bit more sense of how light and airy it actually is inside. You can maybe also get a sense from this image that you can walk through this aisle and continue to the transept. And the transept is actually the same height as the aisles and nave around it. So it really felt like a continuation of the space. But they wanted to make these buildings as tall as possible. There's an increasing interest in doing that as well, to draw your eye upward. Um, and a couple of the ways we see the space articulated here, we have more attached columns to the piers in this upper gallery level. You have these little colonnettes that contain smaller arches within, above the larger archways here. And then you also have what's called ribs on the barrel vault. So we have the same barrel vault that the Romans were using, but in order to add some decoration, but also for structural support to help bring the weight of the roof down to the columns and the piers to bring it down to the ground, you have these ribs attached to it. This particular moment here, this where this column capital is, this is called the springing of the vault, that moment when it changes from wall to roof space. Here I'm showing you a view of the roof over the nave, gives you a much better view of these ribs and the springing of the vault. So you can see how this was how they decorated the interior of their churches. Their interest was not on covering the entire wall with marble like we saw in Hagia Sophia or covering it in glittering mosaics. They were all about accommodating the pilgrim and encouraging this pilgrimage through the space to see the relics rather than the images that could be contained within the space, although there would have been images on nearly every altar. Here's a view of the West Work with these two large towers to mark the main facade of the space. I want to talk for just a minute about this space here. I, I pointed it out to you in the plan once called the portal, the major entrance here. But the portal comes to be a very important place for imagery in Romanesque churches. So over the doorway, over the main doorway here, maybe you can see in this photograph, there's actually a large sculptural program here, and this was very common for Romanesque churches. It becomes a point that is a sort of liminal space. That is, it's a threshold between the outside world and the inside world. So the imagery there could sort of prepare you for the whole point of going inside the church. Here I'm showing you what's called the tympanum, this arched space above the doorway, a tympanum. And this is where we have a major scene of a last judgment. Now, I don't want to talk about this one in too much depth, but I wanted to show it to you. We'll talk about another example, my favorite example instead. But you see what you've got going on here. You have Christ enthroned, surrounded by a full body halo. He's surrounded by angels. 
and this is a last judgment scene where he's separating the saved from the damned and down here you have all sorts of fantastic little scenes of hell and this is the thing that is the closest to your head as you go in so you would have been a pilgrim you would have walked into this space and you would have seen the penalty for not being a good Christian, and that is to go to hell. So it's, it almost becomes a sort of billboard of imagery to convey certain messages to the pilgrims. Just like with what we saw at the Parthenon with the Panathenaic procession, this is a way to communicate a particular story to your viewer. Athens was celebrating their civic life and this major festival to their patron deity, whereas at these Romanesque churches, they're trying to convert people, trying to encourage good Christians, encourage pilgrims to keep traveling and go to these relics to take off some of their time from hell because pilgrimages meant a good economy for these churches. I wanted to remind you of the details of the carving at the Parthenon. You can see this strong interest on naturalism, this calm, harmonious appearance of the classical period. Things are fairly well proportioned. They're trying to make things look like real figures on real horses. By contrast, in the Romanesque, there's less of an emphasis on naturalism. And again, you don't want to think about it as if they couldn't do it. But this was the style that they chose to use at this time. It's more stylized. It perhaps conveys the message a bit more clearly. You can see it from further away better. So here's just a couple of details from the conch tympanum, you see this hell mouth and these poor people are being sent into it by these crazy devils. It almost looks like from where the wild things are. Here we have a soldier who hasn't been so well behaved. He's being grabbed by demons. So the point of these pilgrimages was to visit relics and relics were very often kept in these spectacular containers called reliquaries. A relic is usually a body part or some kind of object associated with a holy figure and often these reliquaries have, they take the shape of whatever they contain. Many relics are from martyrs who are people who died for their faith. Churches are often also built in cemeteries or over the martyr's tomb when it could be. Other times they brought the relics to an already existing structure. Often body parts are split up so that every altar could have a relic. Technically inside a Catholic church, every altar is supposed to have a relic. We're looking at the reliquary of Saint Foy, the patron saint of the church at Conque Saint Foy, which means Saint Faith. Foy means faith in French. She was a virgin martyr from 303 who was executed as a child for refusing to worship pagan idols. And the church of Saint Foy was erected over her tomb. This reliquary is made of gold. The face reuses a Roman mask which was formed over the skull of the saint. So that's what I meant when I said that whatever it contains shapes what it is. So if you have an arm bone, often the reliquary will look like a giant golden arm. The gold has been placed over a wooden core for stability. She has her arms open as if she's welcoming pilgrims. Relics enhance the prestige of the community, so they would go to great length to have important relics. Sometimes they would buy them, there were a lot of examples even of theft. For example, this relic was actually stolen by a monk from a different monastery. He entered the monastery that had the relics, became a member, was trusted over several years, and then stole it as soon as they made him guard of the relics. So there were these serious missions. They don't always look like this from the beginning. All of the precious stones, the cameos, all of these things that are added to it, these get added over time very often, sometimes by the pilgrims who come, who want to say thank you for whatever blessing that they have received. Here's a better detail of the face so you can get a sense of uh, just how precious the materials are. So this gold has been beaten out around the face and these beautiful jewels have been laid in on the crown, even as her eyes, and she even wears these beautiful earrings. So it was very easy for pilgrims to spot these important relics because they were kept in containers like this. I want to turn now to another portal image that comes from the city of Autun in modern day France. Here's a wide view of the portal. So we have the tympanum here. This is a last judgment scene from the west portal of the Cathedral of Saint-Lazare in Autun. And we actually have a named artist here. His name is Guise Libertus. This comes from about 1120 to 1130. Now I say that Gisela Veritas is the name of the artist, but there's actually some new theories that perhaps it was the wealthy family who commissioned it. 
With Romanesque sculpture, especially here, we see an attenuation of forms. That is, all of the bodies are these long, drawn out, angular bodies. We have a bit of hieratic scale going on here. There's lining up and stacking of figures to show who's in the background to create depth while working within the shape of the space. What the Last Judgment is, is a scene of the Second Coming where Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. The dead are resurrected from their graves and taken up to heaven or sent to hell if they are not worthy of heaven. It would have been really terrifying to the visitor. These were popular on entrances to these churches, as I said, because it emphasizes the liminality of the earthly and the heavenly, how these are two separate spaces and two separate realms, and this door is this transitionary space. Just to name a couple of the elements of the portal, we have the tympanum, which I've been talking about. Here's the large portal. These elements are all called jam columns because this area here next to the door is the jam. This central supporting element is called a trumeau. And here, this horizontal element that often also has sculpture is called a lintel. And this comes from a type of architecture called post and lintel architecture. We have a vertical element that's a post and the horizontal element is the lintel. Think of the Parthenon, that's a great example. Lots of cultures use post and lintel architecture. Here's a detailed view where we can talk a little bit more about what's happening in this story. So we have Christ in the center with a full body halo called a mandorla. On the right side of Christ, we have the Virgin Mary who intercedes on behalf of some people. The damned are always on Christ's left. Now the word in Latin for left is sinister. So you can see why we think of left as bad sometimes. Christ is always in the middle of these sculptures like this, often either pointing up to heaven or down to hell, or here he has his arms open wide to welcome you into the church to be saved. So to save you from what could happen to you if you are going to hell. There's an inscription that runs along just above the lintel, and here I'm showing you the part that has the name of Gies Libertus, who is either the artist or the name of the family who commissioned it. The inscription also has this statement, may this terror terrify those whom earthly error binds, for the horror of these images here in this manner truly depicts what will be. So it even tells you what lesson it's trying to teach you for those people who could read, which was not everybody. Here's one of my favorite details from the whole scene. Here we have a weighing of the souls. You have the Archangel Michael here, and they're putting these little bodies into these baskets right here. He's weighing this soul. The saved soul is actually heavier because it has more goodness in it. And you see these demons on this side who are trying to pull down on the scale, who are trying to jump in the basket and try to get the soul for themselves. Here we can also see some scenes from hell. This poor guy who has just risen out of his grave, these evil hands are picking him up by the head. These poor people, everybody nude, is being ripped away by demons. And then there, many of them are being shoved into this hell mouth over here as well. He's got a couple of different ways to get into hell. And here's a view of a couple of the people who are hoping to be saved. They're not being dragged into hell. They're looking up towards Christ. I wanted to point this out because of the bags that they're carrying, these little symbols that they have on their bags, those actually indicate them as pilgrims. They're carrying walking sticks. We can't really see them much anymore. They've broken off, but they would have been over their shoulder. And especially this scallop shell, this was a major symbol of somebody who went to Santiago de Compostela. So the pilgrimage is being indicated as something that's going to save you here, but still they look scared, even though they've made this great journey in life. And here's another view of that hell mouth. So some of the Romanesque stylistic features are the, is this agitation, a lot of crossed limbs, twisting, and attenuation of forms. They're very abstracted and stylized. They, people are not hiding their emotion at all. They're making these dramatic gestures, so you get the point of the story. I want to talk about one final monument today, and that is today held in and named for the city in northern France called Bayeux. It's this very famous object that's quite different than what we've been looking at so far. One of the major differences with this image, the Bayeux Tapestry, is that it is showing a secular event. So this is not a Christian event, although it does have some Christian elements. Stylistically, it shares some similarities with the portal sculpture I've been showing you, with the attenuated form, the movement of the figures, and the expressive faces, and how linear they are. What we see in the Bayeux Tapestry is the events leading up to the Norman invasion of England, and this culminates with the Battle of Hastings in the year 1066. It's 20 inches high, 
And I'm only showing you one detail of this right now because it's actually almost 300 feet long. It was probably meant to be hung in a castle room. It's decorative. It's not a kind of tapestry that can warm the room like a lot of tapestries did. And in fact, it's not even fair to call it a tapestry. It's actually an embroidery. So the Normans were a group that were descended from the Vikings who had taken over northern France. That's why that region is now called Normandy. They became warriors in the context of an aristocratic society. They lived on the coast of France, and within the Bayeux Tapestry, they are often shown on horseback fighting, whereas the Anglo-Saxons, those that they conquered in England, are often shown fighting on foot, and they often are depicted in the tapestry with mustaches. So I'm going to show you several scenes from this just to give you a sense of the great story that it's telling. There are vignettes of the major events that happened leading up to the battle and during the battle, and then there's also Latin inscriptions to help guide you through the scenes. Here, seated on a throne, we're seeing King Edward. He was the king of England. You see him sitting on a very stylized throne in some kind of architecture. Notice the scale is very strange. They occupy the entire space of this building, so they're trying to communicate a message. They're not trying to make it look like real space. This is the very beginning of the tapestry. You can see the border here. You can see the very decorative elements in the borders, a lot like manuscript decoration, actually. Harold, who was the duke and brother-in-law of the King of England, went to see William, the King of France. He decides here, what we're seeing here, is that he's going to shift his allegiance to William rather than his brother-in-law, the King of England. And here what we see him doing where he's touching these two objects, he's swearing fealty to him. So he's promising that he will support King William of France. Edward died shortly thereafter, and Harold decided to take Edward's throne because he was the brother-in-law, he saw himself as the rightful heir. Here I'm showing you the funeral procession of King Edward. We have the body in this enormous box-like thing being carried to the church. Notice how much bigger the figures are than the church. They can never quite get inside it, but remember, this is just trying to tell the story as clearly as possible. One of my favorite details is here, the hand of God is coming down to give divine authority to the king or to show, to show divine intervention at the death of the king. Here we see an image of Harold enthroned. Notice his fantastic mustache here. He's holding a scepter and an orb with a cross on it and is crowned. And the text here is declaring him that he is seated as the king. Here we see Harold again on the throne, but one of the major reasons I'm actually showing you this image, another fantastic detail from the Bayou Tapestry, is this detail right here. And what we're actually seeing is supposed to be Halley's Comet. They called it the Harry Star. And that's what we're seeing up here, the Istimirant Stella. And look at all these people who are just like those figures at Autun. They're all elongated and twisting, and they're all pointing up to the star to make sure that you look at it too. And they saw it as a bad omen for Harold. Notice that it's flying right over him. They didn't know what comets were. They would have been rather terrifying. So Harold had sworn fealty to William. He reneged on that agreement by taking over the throne. And so what happens next is that the Normans begin constructing ship. Harold had broken his oath, so William decided to invade England, and he started what's called the Battle of Hastings, because that's where it takes place. This is the William who becomes known as William the Conqueror for this reason. So we see them here chopping down the trees, making the boat. Here's a nice detail to give you a sense of the stitching. Everything's outlined, and then some of it is filled in. It's a very basic embroidery technique. Here we see them taking off over the waters through the English Channel to get to England, and they even have their horses on the boat. How else are you going to fight? You have to bring your horses. And their ships are very reminiscent of Viking ships that have been discovered. Here we see them charging into battle. Here are the French. Notice the border starts giving away from these nice decorative animal pattern features to elements of the battle scene. We have fallen soldiers, fallen horses. This guy's head just happens to be over here. Things get even more chaotic. You see these horses who are tumbling around, more dead bodies at the, at the bottom, more body parts dismembered. It's very dramatic. That's the point, is to be dramatic and to tell this story. The artist is not interested in showing a three-dimensional reality, but instead in telling this lively story. Here's another really nice detail. I love this one, actually. You can see the really intricate stitching work. You can see this fallen soldier with his sword here. And just like what happens in 
wars, he is stripped of his armor by somebody else who needs it. The dead are dead. We have to reuse our stuff. It was almost certainly made in England because it's similar to some Anglo-Saxon textiles that survive, but it's also theorized that perhaps it hung in a cathedral in France. So we, there's really a lot, of, a lot we don't know about this object. Okay, so that was a lot of material that we covered today. We talked about portable art objects as symbols of wealth in the early medieval period. Remember Sutton Hoo's purse cover and these books, especially we saw an emphasis on Christianity once we got to the books because Christian missionaries come in and, and convert these tribes. We talked a lot about monastic book production. This is one of the major tasks that monks do besides pray, and this is these are major repositories for some incredible art created at the time, but also for the survival of books from the ancient world. We also talked about pilgrimage with the Romanesque period and how the cult of relics was the driving force behind that. So now in order to complete module six, you'll need to take the self-assessment. Remember that has elements from this lecture, but also your readings. Next on the discussion board, I'd like you to talk about modern pilgrimages. Think about if we do something similar to what those of the Romanesque period did is, do you know anybody who makes a journey to go somewhere for whatever their reason might be? Also, you have your next journal entry. There's, an, a, there's a great website where you can explore the Book of Kells. You can see lots of different pages that we didn't even get to talk about, and I'll have a little bit more of a prompt for you there. And finally, the vocabulary wiki. This is up to you, Group 3. So thank you for watching, and I will see you for the Gothic period with Module 7.